I've been thinking a long time about creativity, and as it came into focus that I was going to write this book, I read all the other books. And I don't think anybody knows what they're talking about. Most of the books are written from people in fields of psychology, sociology. What do they know? We're in the midst of people who are actually doing it every day. So calling on that, that sort of led me to think in a new way. First, I'll begin with about me and how I came to write this book. Just quickly on my background, I studied at University of Pennsylvania, worked on the Albany Mall with Harrison and Valorovitz, worked with Ulrich Franz, and um, we had a Ford Foundation grant called New Forms of the Evolving City. Rudolph and Franz and were both doing this. And we looked at all kinds of new stuff. I was in charge of research on technology. One of the things we looked at was something called Project Genie being worked out at MIT, where you push a button on a telephone pole and zoom, a taxi shows up. Who knew it was going to be your cell phone? <laughs> that was in the 1960s. I did a book on the architect Louis Kahn. I was an environmental sculptor, did work at the Architecture League, then curated the shows. I am director of research for a project called Timeship, which is a biotech research, works with a lot of futurists. I've done some MOOCs at Build Academy. You can find my MOOC, massive open online course, <laughs> free online courses. So I have one on Frank Lloyd Wright. You can check in on any time. I do a radio show every Monday, 10 a.m., but you can also hear them on archives. I try to interview the kind of people we'll be talking about today. I blog at Visionary Creativity. You can find out more about me at Lobel. Dot com. I actually pay Pratt students to tutor me in Twitter and Facebook so I can figure out what the hell that stuff's about. I want to talk about how I come to be where I am. My parents, my mother, father, and grandfather who lived with us had a totally different way of thinking. You know, it, it was questioning everything, not taking anything for granted. I get to the University of Pennsylvania. My professors included Fontaine, who the whole course was on Spengler's Decline of the West, very much out of fashion but uh, today, but very influential a while back. Dean Perkins allowed me to do an independent master's degree where I was able to just spend a year thinking. And my other teachers included Kahn, Venturi, Denise Scott Brown. And very influential on me was Edmund Bacon, who saw cities in a kind of Hegelian way, city as a manifestation of form of a culture. And after I left Penn, I was involved with Joseph Campbell, learning how myths live in us today, Chung Meng Chang, with whom I studied Tai Chi as a way of studying Taoism with your body. Chung Meng Trumpa Rinpoche was my Buddhist master, and I studied shamanism with Michael Horner. And really incredibly interesting, influential people at Pratt. And I only, I didn't want to name anybody because then I'd be leaving people out. So since Bill had retired, I put Bill Catavalis here, but he's back, he's sitting right here. Bill came to University of Pennsylvania in 1963, gave a lecture that totally opened my mind. And one of his great lines is, lies are the scaffolding on which the truth is built. And then you have to think about what does that mean, and it leads to whole other ways of thinking. You know, if I were doing a course on this book, which hopefully I will, what would be the books you would read? And I would start with Marilyn Ponty, who tells us that the perceptual organ is your body as much as your mind. So that the subjective organ that projects and organizes the world is as much your body, you know, it's because we have a front and back and a right and left orients the whole way we see the world. McLuhan, 1964, suddenly totally opened it up and said, hey, all of our technology then adds on to that. So now we take Mila Ponty and add McLuhan. I don't know why people don't think that way. I mean, that's what's going on. That suddenly your automobile is an extension of your body. Your TV is an extension of your body. Kuhn and Structure of Scientific Revolutions told us how scientific think from these cultural changes. And right now we're in a quantum world. My favorite book is Nick Herbert's Quantum Reality. And then I'll include Spengler, who tells us that how cultures have meaning. Joseph Campbell, that goes into great detail on what Spengler was talking about. And then people like Lynn Margulies, 
who totally puts to rest Darwin's natural selection. Her book, What is Life? Talking about the computational basis of information in life. And then, sir, remind anybody of anything? Schrodinger wrote a book called What is Life? And Crick and Watson and everybody read it. And that led to the, you know, the, the discovery of the structure of DNA. And finally, Wolfram's A New Kind of Science shows that the whole world is computational. So whole ways of thinking. So that's me, stuff that influenced me. So now let's talk about what is visionary creativity. And I want to start by noticing the books that I read. Most of them are not about creativity, they're about mastery. And mastery is important, but it's not creativity. And then innovation, okay, innovation is important, but it's not creativity. And then creativity, but writing a well-conceived legal brief, preparing an elegant meal, could be an act of creativity. Visionary creativity is something else, and it is embedded in its culture. So that's what I'll talk about for the next few minutes. And right away, nobody out there knows what culture is. So here we are, I teach in the required sequence for history theory, so we go from you know, before we emerge as human beings up to postmodernism to today, and we're immersed in cultures. Architecture is a manifestation in form of a culture. Materialists don't know that, so Jared Diamond in Guns, Germs, and Steel presents a materialist approach to culture. I come from a meaning approach. And then right away, a parallel to that is that most of the books that I've read present a materialist approach to creativity. Neuroscience, psychology, sociology, memes. I don't even know what that's supposed to be. 10,000 hours, rather than coming from art, biography, story, and the courses I teach here. We look at architects who are doing this, or artists who are doing this, or musicians or whatever. So we live in cultures. Cultures are meaning systems. Cultures create us. And in a virtuous circle, we create our cultures. And visionary creatives change cultures. They're really dangerous people. They bring about totally new worlds, and in so doing, they destroy all worlds. So they're not always favorably looked upon. Just like, you know, the yellow taxi cab industry is not too happy about Uber. <laughs> and Uber's only the beginning, when you think about what they're gonna do. Because as soon as they have self-driving Ubers, you won't need a car anymore. My car spends about 90% of its time parked. So if the cars are working all the time, maybe you only need 10% as many cars. How does that change everything? I mean, from, from when I was in school through to this day, we railed against the evil of the automobile, how Los, New York is wonderful because you have subways, and Los Angeles is terrible because it's dependent on the automobile, and, but we're always going to be stuck with it. Suddenly, it's about to disappear. So when you, you write a book, you, you know, the thing is, I have a colleague who's really brilliant. He churns out these books. He did a blurb on my book on, uh, on Amazon, so I was supposed to do one of his. And he, he calls me up a month later, Lil Bell, where's my blurb? And I said, I'm still reading the book. He's written three more since then. <laughs> so, you know, we, we tend to write more books than we read. So I figured, uh, for the people who are not going to read my book, it's all on the cover. So that's all you have to read. Visionary creatives swim in the culture of their day and manifest in their work the spirit of their age. So we've been trying to think that way here at Pratt. Architecture is a manifestation in form of a culture. The things they create in art, design, science, technology, business, embody that spirit and at the same time restructure our consciousness and pull us into the future. So to understand creativity, indeed to understand ourselves, we need totally different models of reality than that of the material social sciences. Here's Ortega y Gasset. The reality of history lies in biological power, in pure vitality, in that which is in man of cosmic energy. No sociologist can use the term cosmic energy. No psychology, but they got to measure the difference in cosmic energy in their rats running through the maze after, you know, 
It, it, you can't do that in those fields. But you can't talk about art without these terminologies, and you can't talk about creativity without talking about art. Not identical with, but related to the energy which agitates the sea, fecundates the beast, causes the tree to flower and the star to shine. Joseph Campbell writes, myth is the secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos. How do you measure inexhaustible energies in your, you know, psychology rat maze experiments? Pour into cultural manifestations. And Van Gogh writes, wings, wings to fly above life, wings to fly above the grave and death. That is what we want, and I am beginning to understand that we can get that. Now, there's no way you can look at, talk about, experience Van Gogh's paintings without this point of view. This is what he was doing. And we live in that world. I'll just pick on the sociologists and psychologists. They don't. So when we talk about the Renaissance, we talk about the emergence of an individual with a psychological interior who has a point of view, a center of reference in the center of Claudio's Villa Rotunda, which then marks out the X, Y, and Z axes for the point of view from which man can be the measure of all things, in the slogan of the Renaissance borrowed from the Greeks, so that perspective painting, the Copernican universe, the psychological depth of Renaissance art, the positioning in the landscape of Renaissance architecture, is this humanist, human-centered point of view. We get to the 19th century, and suddenly all that's gone. We're in fields. Maxwell's equations, electric fields. Particles are simply tight vortices in energy fields. They're not solid objects. And we can see these fields, put a piece of paper over a magnet and sprinkle iron filings on it. And we see the swirling energies of Van Gogh's paintings. OK, so that's an approach. So from that approach, what would we say about our own 21st century? And I'm going to look at three things, uh, quantum entanglement, symbiogenesis, and genomics. So what do we mean by that? So you've heard the term Bell's theorem. And Bell, working with Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen's work from the 30s, shows that particles can be entangled. Once they're entangled, what you do to one particle will be reflected in a particle on the other side of the universe instantly, superluminous, faster than the speed of light, which means the universe is put together in a totally different way than the Newtonian space-time model. That's the world we're living in today. Lynn Margulies shows that what drives evolution is not natural selection, but the wholesale movement of whole bundles of DNA from one creature to another. The mitochondria, the energy centers in each cell, have their own DNA, separate from our DNA, because they're a bacteria that got embedded into other creatures a long time ago. Same thing with the cells that do the, the chloroplasts that do the photosynthesis in plants. They're from some bacteria that got embedded into the plant. So all this stuff's moving around, we're exchanging it all the time. The bacteria in our bodies weighs the same as our brains. And we're just starting to realize that and what that means. And then Stephen Wolfram shows us that simple rules build the rich universe in which we live. So genomics is not just that which happens with DNA, yes, but he shows that the whole universe works that way. And then he says, with one of my favorite statements of all time, I think when I find the code that generates our world, it'll be just about six lines. <laughs> See, this entire universe is generated from six lines of code. I mean, what a way of thinking. I don't, he hasn't found it yet, but he's working on it. So a metaphor to help us think this way, and we'll look at Surat's Sunday afternoon in the park. From a distance, as we all know, the people are stately, neoclassical, but then when we zoom in, and zoom in, and zoom in, they're all made up of these pointless dots. The world and we are clusters of interconnected fractal networks, computationally generating themselves and each other. Whole different way of seeing the world. 
And visionary creatives in our time will be the people who directly experience that. Today's visionary creatives are natives of this world of clustered, interconnected fractal networks, computationally generating themselves and each other. The things they create in art, design, science, technology, business, make this world apparent to all of us. I can understand this stuff. A digital network native, <laughs> we used to say digital native, right, for the kids who tell us how to fix our computers, grow up in this. It just, that, that's the way it is for them. And they go nuts that, why don't other people get it? And so then they're driven to create things like Facebook that interconnect everybody. Carver Mead finally said, electrodynamics had not been integrated with quantum theory. So he writes a book a couple years ago, Collective Electrodynamics, which did the job, and he shows electrons do not exist as objects, they're just relationships. Elon Musk's electric cars, that's not what it's about. It's that they're going to be self-driving. Once you're self-driving, well, the LiDAR will know that the car in front is about to stop. No, the LiDAR will know that somebody's just finishing breakfast and has on their calendar that they're going to, you know, the, uh, the office and is going to be on this road at this time and you should take a different route. And so this whole different new worlds unfold. My first Macintosh, I was the first person at Pratt to get a Macintosh. I was told Pratt will not get any computer that's got a mouse. And I said, this is an art school. I'm getting a computer with a mouse. So in the first 100 days when the first Mac came out, I got mine. And it was self-contained. I had a modem, but you know, I wasn't plugged in all the time. Now, on my iPhone, I'm trying to get a song on my iPhone. It's not there. It's in the cloud. It won't let me put it. I go to put it on the iPhone. It says, you can't put that on the iPhone. You already have it in the cloud. I don't want to get it from the cloud. I want it on my iPhone where I know I have it. it won't let me do it. <laughs> Everybody has to be interconnected and plugged in. So when you ask the question, how powerful is your iPhone? And the answer is, it's called infinite computing because it's plugged into the cloud. And then it's all network tied together in these ways that, like I said, I'm paying these Pratt students to tutor me on how to use this stuff. You know, I check in on, on Kurzweil AI, I get the newsletter every day, and just nine days ago, I clipped this one and put it in here. Self-powered materials that compute and recognize simple patterns. They're making this stuff now. So, how do you become a visionary creative? Well, you know, Education for creativity. A few months ago, there was an op-ed piece in the New York Times, How to Raise a Creative Child. Step one, back off. <laughs> so, we read. They learn to read at age two, play Bach at four, breathe through calculus at six, and speak foreign languages fluently by eight. Their classmates shudder with envy. Their parents rejoice at winning the lottery. But to paraphrase T.S. Eliot, their careers tend to end, not with a bang, but a whimper. So this is now being studied. Try to get into an Ivy League school by telling your high school professors they're full of baloney. Try in an Ivy League school to get into an elite master's program by telling your professors they're full of it and their theories are all wrong. You can't do that. These people can't do it. So then let's look at a different model for how to do this. And we'll turn, of course, to Friedrich Nietzsche from Thus Spoke Zarathustra, The Three Metamorphoses of the Spirit. And Nietzsche says, first you're a camel. And the camel says, put a load on me. And that is the tradition of your culture and your discipline. You master it as well as anybody else. Your entire culture and then the specifics of your discipline. But then you're a lion, and the lion's job is to fight and destroy a dragon whose name is thou shalt, and finally a child. So the camel kneels down and waiting to be loaded. Once loaded, the camel runs out into the desert. But this loading, here's Woodrow Wilson. It is the business of a university to impart the right thought of the world, the thought through which it has 
tested and established the principles which have stood through the seasons to become at length part of the immemorial wisdom of the race. Okay, to me that's step one. What about to question and if need be to overthrow the immemorial wisdom of the race? Where's that part? And to me that's what it's supposed to be about. Such questioning and overthrowing define visionary creativity. So a couple of three mega bestsellers of the moment. Uh, how many people here have a tiger mom? Anybody? There we go. <laughs> okay. The tiger mom. No play dates. Homework seven days a week. Okay. Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. It's not talent, it's perseverance. And he quotes the 10,000 hours thing, which is mastery. And then mega bestseller at the very moment. I just, I just, I'm just reading it a second time because I'm going to write a review. Angela Duckworth's Grit. And the people who succeed are the ones who stick to it. Not the most talented, not the highest IQ, but she's measuring people who are going to make it in special forces. People who are going to make it as quarterbacks in football. Well, that's great, but those are not the people who are going to be creative, who are going to question things. The spirit becomes a lion who would conquer his freedom and be master of his own desert. So that's what these people taught me, to question all of this, to think, okay, fine, I, you know, I, I got to be... I got to be at least a B plus student. I have to master this. I have to go to an Ivy school. I have to study with the great professors. But what they taught me was to question all of it. For ultimate victory, he wants to fight a great dragon. The name of the dragon is thou shalt. On every scale of the dragon is written thou shalt to follow the rules of your discipline. And you're now being challenged to overthrow that. And the spirit of the lion says, I will. I just finished yesterday, so I figured I'd put it in here, Tom Wolfe's new book, The Kingdom of Speech. He totally eviscerates Darwin and Chomsky. <laughs> and it's just, you know, Tom Wolfe's always a joy to read. And since he's in his late 80s now, we want to, uh, we want to enjoy him while we can. But to take on and challenge these major figures, and the people we respect mastered the existing discipline and then overthrew it. Beethoven mastered the Viennese Symphony and then destroyed it with Romanticism. Picasso mastered classical painting by the time he dropped out of the academy. Thelonious Monk worked with the jazz greats creating bebop before he then went into his own realm. And Venturi understood modernism better than any of his critics did uh, before he challenged it with postmodernism. So to create the new values, the lion can't do this. At this point, we then become a child. The child is innocence and forgetting, a new beginning, a wheel rolling out of its own center. So now just to wrap up, what about you? Visionary creatives see that our world is no longer what we had thought it to be, and that a new world is struggling to be born. They wonder, what is wrong with others that they do not also see this? And they are driven to produce works that will help all of us experience what they experience. So whether it's in business, technology, science, art, architecture, it's the same drive. And I respect people in all of these fields who do this. We, on encountering these works, are changed and we enter new worlds. So here's the thought for you. Ask yourself, what is obvious to everyone else but does not seem quite right to you? Now, if you know, you're challenging your professors, you want to be careful, a lot of them are delicate. But then ask yourself, what if? And then you'll have your own direction. So I hope you enjoy my book. It's rich with stories, examples, anecdotes of figures in science and mathematics, architecture, art, literature, film, culture, music, and technology and business. And it's just a, a hope, a rich and enriching experience. 
So that wraps up. We're going to now do discussion and questions, and then we'll do book signing and pizza. So thank you.